We have more information about NASCAR's newly signed charter agreement, plus comments from Brad Keselowski. It sounds like NASCAR did not get one thing they wanted, and Corey Heim finds himself the center of a very stupid controversy after the NASCAR Xfinity Series race in Atlanta. Welcome back to Break Hard, I'm Matt. On Saturday, we got more information about NASCAR's newly signed charter agreement. And of course, the majority of teams have signed this new agreement. 2311 Racing and Front Row Motorsports remain the two holdouts. 2311 Racing in their statement, of course, said that they did not have enough time to fairly bargain on this new charter agreement. Keep in mind, they've had two years at this point. Ultimately, I think what 2311 Racing wants is an equity share of NASCAR. They're just not going to get that. So I'm interested to see how long this standoff lasts and what will eventually be the concession that Denny makes to sign this. I'm not sure what the end goal is here now, but it's going to be an interesting standoff. What the future of the charters for 2311 Racing and Front Row Motorsport are remain up in the air. Bubba Wallace talked about it on Saturday and said, I can't sign my extension for 2025 until this gets done. So now it's affecting my livelihood. Just a lot of moving parts in this entire situation. I'm interested to see how it works out for them. But Brad Keselowski did talk to the media, though, on Saturday, and Kelly Crandall posted it to Twitter. Brad talked about signing the charter, why they went ahead and did it, plus the topic of teams being forced or coerced into signing. And he said, quote, We want to run in NASCAR for a long time to come, and signing a charter agreement is a statement to our commitment to doing just that. We've got great plans for the sport and excited to see that continue for quite some time. He goes on to say, One of these agreements is only good when everybody is a bit jaded. And I think there's things obviously we'd like to have better, but there's pieces we'd really like, and there's pieces not so much, but it's hard to use the word fair. I don't know if I know what that means. And then on the topic of teams being forced to sign is what some media members had said that teams were forced and coerced into signing under the risk of losing their charter if they did not by that NASCAR imposed deadline of midnight on Friday. Uh, Brad said, quote, I don't necessarily know where that's coming from, but force is a really strong term, but we're getting the spot where it's important to get these things settled. So me just kind of trying to interpret what Brad was saying there. I think essentially what it came down to is team sat back and they were like, listen, perfect world. We get what Denny and 2311 racing want. Everybody gets an equity share of NASCAR. That's just not going to happen. NASCAR is not going to give up money, you know, an equity share of the sport and give that to each team. It's just not happening. So the team sat back and looked at it. And the age old adage is, you know, a good negotiation is when both sides leave unhappy. And I think in this situation, both sides are probably leaving unhappy. Teams wanted more than what they got. NASCAR gave up more than probably they wanted to. And now both sides are going to do business together for the, at least the next seven years with an option for another seven years after after that. But the topic of being forced, you know, coerced into signing, I don't know. I don't necessarily know if that's the right term, like Brad said, to to use. I think it was just more of a, hey, this is all you're going to get type of thing. And it does sound like teams got some things that they definitely wanted out of this. Bob Pockers reported that the teams are going to move up from 25% of TV revenue onto this current deal that ends at the end of this season up to 40% in 2025 and beyond. That's a big time step. You know, under the current uh, split, Tracks get 65%, teams get 25, NASCAR gets the other 10. So it now sounds like tracks will get 50, teams will get 40, and NASCAR will get 10 is maybe what it sounds like, um, which is certainly going to help teams out. That is more money in their pocket, so they won't have to be so reliant on sponsorship dollars or at least have to sell at such a high price for sponsorship dollars. So I think that's a good step in the right direction. Today's video is brought to you by Driven Sunglasses. I have the P1s right here. This is the tortoise shell. Uh, head over to drivensunglasses.com. Use code BREAKHARD at checkout for 20% off plus free shipping. If you remember back a few months, there was something added to one of the proposals that NASCAR sent over to teams, which would allow the France family members to purchase charters and compete in the NASCAR Cup Series, field cars in the series. And teams were vehemently against that. They were like, absolutely not. So if you remember, there are four charters that are currently earmarked that NASCAR is holding back. They wanted to be able to purchase those field teams on their own. And teams were like, absolutely not. Those four charters will remain for a fourth manufacturer. Should that ever come, that would raise chartered cars up to 40. What happens with the open cars? Do we get back to 43 car fields? All that remains, you know, up in the air at this point. But I have been, you know, impartial through this entire process, right? I'm just trying to present what NASCAR wants, what the teams want. And ultimately, the fans are stuck in the middle. And I'm just trying to convey, you know, kind of what both sides are asking for in this situation. In this one, I'm not going to be, quote, fair and balanced on this topic because I am vehemently against the series owners fielding a team in the series. I hate it in IndyCar. I hate that Team Penske has a team in IndyCar, a series owned by Roger Penske, because it creates a ton of narratives around preferential treatment, 
and them getting calls in their favor and unfairness and everything that goes along with it. It questions the integrity of the championship of the sport. And I don't want to see that in NASCAR because I think at times NASCAR is unfairly met with questions about the integrity of the sport. And this would just fuel the fire. You're throwing napalm right into it, and it is not going to be a good thing. So I think the teams winning out on this side is definitely for the better, and I have no issues with that at all. So now we'll just have to wait and see how long is 2311 Racing and Front Row going to hold out of the of signing this new charter agreement? Will they be in Daytona? What are they asking for? Um, all of it remains up in the air. I, mean, I am interested to hear if that anti-disparaging... no. <clears throat> I am interested to hear if that disparaging clause that was put into the recent proposal that was sent over to teams was included or not. I can't imagine most teams would have agreed to that, but we'll have to wait and see as more information continues to come out. Moving on to one of the dumbest controversies that we'll have all year. That happened in the Saturday Xfinity Series race in Atlanta. Corey Heim driving on a part-time schedule in the Xfinity Series for Sam Hunt Racing. Coming to the white flag, elected to push the 21 car of Austin Hill rather than jump down to the bottom and push his Toyota manufacturer teammate in Chandler Smith. By doing so, the uh, 26 of Heim goes into the corner and turns one and two with a lot of momentum, tries to go the outside of Austin Hill, ends up in the wall, but ultimately it was the right decision to make. Now, there's a ton of people on the internet that I just don't think understand how racing in Atlanta works and think that the 26 should have jumped down and pushed the 81 of Chandler Smith. Here's the thing. Chandler Smith had no momentum. The 26 had all the momentum, but together they would have no momentum if the 26 had hopped down there. And ultimately, Corey Heim would not be in a position to win that race. By pushing the 21, he continues his momentum, has a bit of a push from the 48 behind him, and still has a shot to win that race if he doesn't get kind of put up into the wall there by Austin Hill, who, didn't, who said he didn't mean to put him in the wall, but still ended up in the wall. After the race, Chandler Smith gets out of the car. And he's got a complete diaper full, and he's upset that Corey Heim didn't jump down and push his Toyota teammate. Okay, a little bit of a backstory here. Corey Heim is the number one prospect in NASCAR. He's the number one prospect Toyota Racing Development currently has. He cannot race at Joe Gibbs Racing. Joe Gibbs Racing will not give him a car. And this goes all the way back to the ARCA days between he and Ty Gibbs because he didn't put up with Ty Gibbs' nonsense, right? Corey Heim would straight up dump Ty the same way Ty would dump anybody else. And because of that, there's bad blood there, and that's why Corey Heim is running for uh, Sam Hunt Racing. Corey Heim should be in a Joe Gibbs Racing car. There's no reason he shouldn't be in a Joe Gibbs Racing car, except for that bad blood. So now Toyota has a predicament on their hand. They have the best prospect in NASCAR right now. They have nowhere to put him in the Xfinity Series other than Sam Hunt Racing, which is not Joe Gibbs Racing. And Corey Heim ha was in position to get his first Xfinity win, get Sam Hunt their first Xfinity Series win. They didn't even have a sponsor on that car. Why would he jump down and push a guy who races for a team that won't give him the light of day? Yeah, absolutely not. Corey Heim made the right decision there, and he should do that 10 out of 10 times. The only the the only uh, thing he did wrong there was not making his move at the right time, but he absolutely made the right decision. After the race, um, Kim Kuhn from NBC asked him, are you afraid of any repercussions? And now I hate this because this stems from a few weeks ago at Daytona and the cup race where Parker Retzloff didn't push... Um, you know, Kyle Busch never had an opportunity to, but, you know, push the 21 car of Harrison Burton to the win at the end and gets out of the car after the race and has RCR and Chevy people screaming at him because he, you know, helped the Ford win the race and not the eight car of Kyle Busch. Listen, at the end of these races, this isn't Formula One. This is NASCAR. And everybody's out here racing for themselves. You put yourself in position to win. Who cares about your manufacturer? Who cares about your teammate? In Corey Himes' situation, he's trying to get his team their first ever win. He's trying to get his first ever win. He does not care. Insert the um, Stephen A. Smith clip. I'm here to tell you right now, we don't care. Let me tell, <laughs> right, let me tell We don't care about Chandler Smith in this moment. And he gets out of the race, uh, gets out of the car, and Kim Kuhn asked him, are you afraid of any repercussions or questions after this? And Corey Heim was like, no. The only thing I am you know, have a question about is when should I have made the move? And he could not have been more unfazed by the fact that people were potentially upset with this. Corey Heim doesn't care about Joe Gibbs Racing. Joe Gibbs Racing doesn't care about Corey Heim. And Chandler Smith's probably not even going to be at Joe Gibbs Racing next year. So why would you push your Toyota teammate across the line or try to push him to victory when he's not really your Toyota teammate uh, next year? So Corey Heim did nothing wrong there. The internet just wants to make a stupid controversy out of this. And yeah, unfortunately, Austin Hill goes to victory lane once again in Atlanta and on a drafting track. So let me know in the comments what you think about um, the charter, the comments from Brad Keselowski, 
uh, the France family not being able to own a charter, as well as the Corey Heim situation in Atlanta. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Break Hard Blog.